Hi everyone, Nurse Jenny here from Nurse Life Academy and I will be reviewing multi-system questions and concepts that you must know for the CCRN exam. I will time mark this video so feel free to just scroll through at your own pace, but I do give extra information and explanations after every question to really reinforce the content. I would greatly appreciate if you like and subscribe to my video if you found it helpful. Without further ado, let's get into the multi-system questions. Question number one. A patient has a norepinephrine infusion running through a peripheral IV. The skin appears puffy about a half inch above the IV insertion site and is also red and tender. What is a priority intervention for this patient? Is it A, apply cold compresses, B, administer hyaluronidase and apply cold compresses, C, restart the IV with a smaller gauge catheter in the opposite arm, or D, administer phentolamine or regetin and apply warm compresses. The answer is D, administer phentolamine or regetin and apply warm compresses. So the antidote for a vasopressor extravasation is phentolamine, and it should be given as soon as possible after the extravasation is identified. If you do give phentolamine, you do want to apply warm compresses after. The difference between an infiltration and an extravasation is the type of medicine or fluid that is leaked. So an infiltration occurs when the fluid is a non-vesicant, meaning that it is not irritating to the tissues. An extravasation occurs when the fluid is a vesicant or it irritates the tissues, and that occurs with stronger medications. Extravasation is serious and it could lead to tissue ischemia, necrosis, pain, infection, or even require surgical intervention. Phentolamine or regetin is used for extravasation of vasopressors or phenotoin. So think to yourself, P and P, pressors and phentolamine, which is spelled with a P. It can be injected directly into the extravasated IV if you haven't taken it out yet, as well as subcutaneously around the extravasated tissue. On the other hand, hyaluronidase is used for extravasated medications such as amiodarone, calcium gluconate, potassium, or mannitol. And when using either of these medications, the phentolamine or the hyaluronidase, you want to use warm compresses. You do want to double check and consult with your pharmacist or your hospital policy for which drugs are vesicants and what kind of a compress should be used for them. Question number two, your patient intentionally overdosed on her beta blocker medication. Her vital signs are a heart rate of 36, blood pressure of 74 over 38 with a MAP of 46, respiratory rate of 20, and an O2 SAT of 93%. Her EKG shows second degree block type two. What is your immediate priority for this patient? Is it A, Administer dextrose 50, 1 amp IV. B, administer glucagon 3 milligrams IV. C, administer 1 amp of calcium chloride IV. Or D, administer atropine 0.5 milligrams IV. And the answer is B. Administer glucagon 3 milligrams IV. With beta blocker overdose, you will certainly have bradycardia, hypotension, a decreased cardiac output, and potentially heart blocks. You can neurologically have lethargy or a decreased level of consciousness or maybe even seizures. And the reversal for beta blocker toxicity is actually glucagon 3 milligrams IV as the initial dose and 5 milligrams IV for a repeat dose. You can also do a continuous infusion, but that isn't seen very often. 
So what glucagon does is it reverses the beta-1 blockade as it mimics positive inotropic effects of beta receptor activation. Question number three. Which strategy should a nurse anticipate when caring for a patient who is increasingly agitated and argumentative from alcohol withdrawal? A. Benzodiazepines B. Vitamins C. Narcotics or D. Anticonvulsants The answer is A. Benzodiazepines Benzodiazepines are the treatment of choice for agitation associated with alcohol withdrawal. Let's talk a little bit about alcohol withdrawal patients. So alcohol withdrawal can potentially be life-threatening and very serious. And it occurs when someone heavily drinks for extended periods of time, whether that is days to months or years, and then suddenly stops or they considerably reduce their alcohol consumption. And this abrupt cessation results in brain hyperexcitability. And as nurses, we have to monitor CEWA scores for these patients, which measures the severity of the alcohol withdrawal. Some signs and symptoms we see with alcohol withdrawal includes agitation, sweating, tremors, tachycardia, insomnia, hallucinations, and largely concerning are your DTs or your delirium tremens and your seizures. Our treatment here is going to include monitoring our CEWA scores. We want to maintain a quiet environment and always maintain patient safety. Long-term use of alcohol leads to GABA inhibition, so we give benzodiazepines such as lorazepam to enhance the effect of the neurotransmitter GABA. So giving benzodiazepines results in sedative, sleep-inducing, anti-anxiety, anti-convulsant, and muscle relaxant properties. Part of the treatment plan is also giving phenobarbital, which has anti-seizure properties. We can also start dexmedetomidine or Presidex for agitation and sedation, and we can administer antipsychotics such as Haldol and Seroquel. You do have to be mindful of the patient's QTCs with these medications, though. We want to administer glucose, thiamine, and multivitamins for these patients who probably lack the vitamins, and also to prevent Wernicke's encephalopathy. And lastly, we want to make sure that we correct electrolyte imbalances, especially hypomagnesemia, which is going to be very prevalent in patients who consume large amounts of alcohol. Hypomagnesemia can lead to a potentially fatal arrhythmia called torsades de point, so we want to make sure that we stay on top of our lab values. Question number four. A patient has a PCA, an IV infusion of morphine at one milligram an hour, and two milligrams of morphine Q15 minutes PRN. The patient is having episodes of sleep apnea and is unarousable. The immediate priority is A. Stopping the continuous infusion and giving a slow IV push of naloxone until the patient awakens. B. Decreasing the morphine continuous infusion rate to 0.5 mg per hour and continuing to monitor that rate. C. Discontinuing the PRN bolus doses and giving a 2 mg IV bolus of naloxone or D, discontinuing PCA, checking the SpO2, and giving naloxone. The answer is A, stopping the continuous infusion and giving a slow IV push of naloxone until the patient awakens. This patient has signs of opioid-induced respiratory depression, so our priority here is going to be to reverse the effects of the morphine with naloxone, otherwise known as Narcan. You certainly want to turn off the continuous infusion instead of halving it since they're already unarousable. And the patient will still need analgesia, but that can be provided with PRN doses once they wake up. 
With opioid overdoses and respiratory depression, you want to know if the patient is ventilating appropriately. And you can tell that from capnography, but you can't tell from SpO2 because SpO2 is a late sign of hypoventilation. Opioid overdoses are the most common overdose in the U.S., the drug most commonly overdosed on the streets is heroin, and for hospitalized patients, it is morphine, Dilaudid, and fentanyl. And symptoms of opioid overdose include respiratory depression, bradycardia, hypotension, and pinpoint pupils. The treatment here is going to be Narcan. In the hospital, we give 0.4 milligrams IV, and it binds to opioid receptors, which reverses the opioid. Its onset is 2 to 3 minutes, and you can repeat 0.4 milligram doses every 2 minutes up to about 10 milligrams. We do need to be careful when we reverse opioids in hospitalized patients, because most of the time we give these medications like morphine, Dilaudid, and fentanyl for pain control. So if we just slam them with 10 milligrams of Narcan all at once, those medications, those opioids that they're using for pain are just going to be gone and they're going to be screaming and writhing in pain. So if able, slowly push naloxone just enough so that they're ventilating properly, but so that you don't completely reverse the opioid. Or you can just do 0.4 milligram doses. Some adverse effects of Narcan can include anxiety, abdominal cramping, and nausea vomiting, so if you do give it, make sure to watch out for those. Question number five. You are taking care of a highly combative and aggressive patient who is in four-point locked restraints but still continues to be severely agitated. Per physician orders, you have given a total of 8 mg of lorazepam or Ativan over a span of 2 hours. You give an additional 2 mg and the patient finally relaxes. One hour later, you check on him and he is sonorous and minimally responsive to even painful stimuli. What is your priority intervention at this time? Is it A. Allow the patient some time to awaken? B. Perform a gastric lavage with activated charcoal. C. Administer naloxone or Narcan 0.4 mg IV. Or D. Administer flumazenil or romazicon 0.2 mg IV. The answer is... D. Administer flumazenil or romazicon 0.2 mg IV. So benzodiazepine overdose is the second most common overdose in the U.S. And there is a higher risk with the elderly, especially when there's cumulative dosing or when accompanied by opioid use. You'll see patients presenting similarly to an opioid overdose. You'll see respiratory depression, hypotension, and confusion being the most common symptoms. Benzodiazepine overdose is reversed with 0.2 mg of IV flumazenil or romazicon, and this dose can be repeated every 1 to 6 minutes for a total of about 1 to 3 mg. Flumazenil's onset is about 1 to 2 minutes, and it peaks at about 6 to 10 minutes, and its duration is 60 minutes. You don't need to know these specific time frames, but what you do need to know is that you have to monitor these patients for resedation because the duration of the benzodiazepine is longer than the flumazenil meaning that they metabolize the flumazenil and the effects of the benzos can reoccur if not completely cleared from the system. Another important thing for benzodiazepine overdoses and reversal is that you want to monitor for benzo withdrawal, specifically for your alcohol withdrawal patients. If you reverse their benzo while they're recovering and they're trying to detox safely, that withdrawal of benzos in their system can actually lead to seizures. I listed here some, but not all, signs and symptoms and treatments for specific toxic agents. 
I just want to point out that ABCs, or airway, breathing, and circulation, will always be your priority interventions. And in case of a benzo overdose, you want to make sure that you monitor for resedation, again, because the duration of benzos is longer than the flumazenil. So they can metabolize the flumazenil, and then they'll be resedated because of the benzodiazepine effect. Question number six. All of the following medications can result in torsades de poids except A. Nortriptyline, B. Procainamide, C. Lorazepam, or D. Amiodarone. The answer is C. Lorazepam. So what do all these medications have in common? All of the medications, except for Ativan, prolong the QT interval. And as we should know, if you don't, then learn it now, prolonged QT intervals can result in torsades de poin. You have to know this. So the nortriptyline, procainamide, and amiodarone all prolong the QT interval. Can you think of any other QT prolonging medication that we give for patients who are combative or aggressive? If you thought of Haldol or Haloperidol, you are totally correct. We can add that onto the list of QT prolonging medications. You will likely see a question about torsades de poids on the CCRN exam. And it's also known as polymorphic ventricular tachycardia, which we went over in the cardiology lecture. And like we just went over in the last question, there are many medications which can prolong the QT. Some of these medications include amiodarone, haloperidol, procainamide, and tricyclic antidepressants such as amitriptyline or nortriptyline. And if there is an overdose of tricyclic antidepressants, you want to give bicarbonate. It helps treat metabolic acidosis and cardiac complications. Additionally, electrolyte imbalances can cause torsades. Hypomagnesemia is a big one, especially if you have a patient with alcoholism. They are at very high risk for hypomagnesemia. Otherwise, hypokalemia and hypocalcemia may also cause torsades. The treatment for torsades is going to be 1 to 2 grams IV piggyback of magnesium sulfate, and then, of course, addressing your cause. So fixing electrolyte imbalances or discontinuing these QT prolonging medications or perhaps just adjusting their dosages. Question number 7. You admit a patient with pneumonia. The vital signs are as follows. Heart rate of 122, blood pressure of 78 over 42 with a MAP of 50, respiratory rate of 38, and a temperature of 38.9 degrees Celsius. What is your highest immediate priority? Is it A, administer antibiotics? B, obtain a lactate level? C, Administer 30 milliliters per kilogram of IV fluid, or D, start a norepinephrine drip. The answer is C, administer 30 milliliters per kilogram of IV fluid. So it looks like this patient has pneumonia and that they are in severe sepsis based on their vitals. Administering antibiotics and obtaining a lactate level are important and they are a part of the sepsis bundle, which we should be getting as soon as possible. However, remember back to your ABCs. This patient's blood pressure is 78 over 42 with a MAP of 50. They are not doing well, and their circulation needs to be improved. Our priority here is going to be to restore that intravascular volume by giving 30 milliliters per kilogram of crystalloids. We all know that early detection and recognition is key. 
And all of these things are extremely important to do as early as possible, but always remember your ABCs first. It's important to know that the evidence-based sepsis bundle includes labs, fluids, and antibiotics. For fluids, we're giving 30 milliliters per kilogram crystalloid boluses to start. After that first 30 milliliters per kilogram fluid resuscitation, you want to make sure that you reassess their fluid volume status. And if they're not overloaded, give more fluid. If your MAP is persisting despite that aggressive fluid administration, you may need to start pressors. And in that case, levofed or norepinephrine is going to be your first line vasopressor for sepsis. For labs, you want to draw an initial lactic acid, which you will treat and trend until normalized. And the lactate tells you how well the tissues are being perfused. You should also get blood cultures as early as possible. Next is antibiotics. The goal is to give broad spectrum antibiotics within one hour of sepsis recognition. If you can't get blood cultures before starting the antibiotics, get them as soon as possible, but don't delay the antibiotics. And lastly, source control. So what is the source of your patient's infection and severe sepsis? And are there any other interventions that we can do? Question number eight. A patient is receiving mechanical ventilation with a propofol drip infusing at 50 mics per kilogram per hour in order to maintain a RAS score of minus 1 to minus 2. The patient becomes agitated with a RAS score of plus 3 and a behavioral pain score of 10, for which the range is 3 to 12. A blood pressure of 152 over 94 and a heart rate of 112. Which of the following interventions would be appropriate? A. Increase the propofol infusion to 60 mics per kg per minute. B. Give lorazepam 2 mg IV. C. Give morphine 2 mg IV. Or D. Order an arterial blood gas stat. The answer here is C. Give morphine 2 mg IV. So the patient is demonstrating agitation with a RAS score of plus 3, but it is due to pain because of their behavioral pain scale being 10. Therefore, an analgesic is indicated for the patient's agitation that's coming from pain. An increase in the propofol dose or the administration of lorazepam would not address the pain. It's important to know that you do not want to use sedation to treat pain. Question number nine. A patient is being treated for a confirmed salicylate overdose. Which of the following interventions should the nurse anticipate? A. Closely monitor for respiratory depression. B. Prepare for hemodialysis. C. Administer thiamine 100 mg IV. Or D. Administer N-acetylcysteine. The answer is B. Prepare for hemodialysis. Salicylate overdoses can very quickly result in metabolic acidosis and can lead to acute kidney injury and failure. So we want to dialyze these patients early to give the patient the best outcomes possible. Question number 10. A patient is receiving a continuous sedation infusion of propofol or diprovan at 30 mics per kilogram per minute. Which of the following is an appropriate intervention for this patient? Is it A. Reverse the side effects with flumazenil or romazicon? B. Provide a daily spontaneous awakening trial? C. Avoid administering analgesia? Or D. Monitor the patient closely for hypertension. The answer is B. 
provide a daily spontaneous awakening trial. So studies have shown improved patient outcomes, shorter ventilator times, and less risk of oversedation when awakening trials are done for patients on a continuous sedation infusion. To go through the other answer choices, you don't reverse propofol with flumazenil, and analgesia should be used for agitation. You do not want to avoid controlling someone's pain. And lastly, propofol is likely to cause hypotension, not hypertension. To touch a little bit more on sedation vacations or spontaneous awakening trials, let's talk about it. So unless there is some kind of clinical indication, we don't want to over-sedate our patients. We need to think less is more, and most patients should probably have a RAS goal of negative 1. And this means that they awaken to voice and they stay awake for longer than 10 seconds. And depending on where you work, that might not be the case, but either way, evidence-based practice does say that we should be waking patients up every day and pausing that sedation as long as it's tolerated. The sedation vacation or spontaneous awakening trial should be done in conjunction with a spontaneous breathing trial or an SBT on the ventilator. And you want to make sure that patients are stable before performing spontaneous breathing trials. Some signs that a patient is not tolerating a spontaneous awakening trial or breathing trial includes dangerous agitation, tachypnea, increased work of breathing, desaturation to less than 90%, and signs of hemodynamic compromise or instability such as hypotension or arrhythmias. Question number 11. Which of the following physiological responses may occur during the induction phase of targeted temperature management, or TTM? A, a decrease in blood glucose, B, hyperkalemia, C, increased cardiac output, or D, platelet dysfunction? The answer is, D, platelet dysfunction. So this comes down to altered coagulation, which occurs at lower body temperatures. So targeted temperature management, or TTM, is used as a treatment to preserve neurological function post-cardiac arrest. And we don't just do TTM on every single person who cardiac arrests. There is inclusion and exclusion criteria that the physician will assess for. Generally, we'll cool patients to about 32 to 36 degrees, whatever is ordered by the physician. And we will initiate sedation to try to keep the patient comfortable, but also in an attempt to prevent shivering, which consumes a lot of energy, which we don't want. During the maintenance phase, where the patient is sitting at the ordered physician temperature, usually for about 24 hours or so, there are many systemic effects of hypothermia that we must be mindful of. So hypothermic patients may have a higher degree of insulin resistance, resulting in hyperglycemia, so we may need to start an insulin drip during the maintenance phase. There are also electrolyte and fluid shifts that occur, most importantly, patients get hypokalemic, for which we would need to replace their potassium. Patients can shiver due to the cold core temperature, so we might need to increase sedation or use Demerol or paralytics even. And shivering usually doesn't stop unless we intervene. They can have platelet dysfunction due to an alteration in coagulation, decreased cardiac output, and they can lose their pupil or corneal reflexes due to that hypothermia. When it comes to the rewarming phase, potassium replacement usually needs to be stopped about eight hours prior to rewarming due to the rebound hyperkalemia that occurs. And of course, during this entire process, you wanna be monitoring their vitals, their neuroassessment, and their labs very closely. Question number 12. 
Which of the following strategies has been demonstrated to reduce incidences of caudies? A. Remove the indwelling urinary catheter on day three post-op. B. Place the drainage collection system on the patient's abdomen during transport. C. Assess the competency of the staff using a simulated environment. Or D. Avoid the use of intermittent straight catheterization. And the answer here is C. Assess the competency of the staff using a simulated environment. So you may have a question about healthcare associated infections, and they're generally looking to see if you know the latest evidence-based practice. And sets of nursing care bundles were created based on evidence-based practice that have been shown to improve outcomes. A caudy is a catheter-associated urinary tract infection, and that means that it is a confirmed urinary tract infection within 48 hours of urinary catheter placement. We can avoid caudies in a multitude of ways. When it comes to insertion, we want to avoid insertion if at all possible. But if we can't and we really need that catheter, we can standardize the reasons for insertion. So those can be limited to things like operative procedures, urinary or bladder outlet obstruction, accurate measurements of eyes and O's, comfort care, or healing sacral or perineal wounds. And as always, when inserting a urinary catheter, you want to maintain aseptic technique. When it comes to maintenance of catheters, you want to review Foley necessity daily. You want to do routine catheter care, maintain unobstructed flow of urine below the level of bladder even during transport, you don't want to disconnect components and break that red seal, and generally you want to remove on post-op day one. Evidence-based practice says that you want to assess competency of staff who insert and care for Foley's, you want to perform root cause analyses on infections, but don't wait to remove that catheter until that root cause analysis is done because that takes a long time. You do want to educate all staff regarding caudi prevention and then go ahead and share the results with the staff. Question number 13. The initial management of any drug intoxication is to A. Prevent further absorption of the drug B increase excretion of the drug, C, administer an antidote when appropriate, or D, ensure a patent airway and adequate breathing. And the answer is D, ensure a patent airway and adequate breathing. Remember, it always comes back to the ABCs. If the patient can't breathe, they won't survive. So everything else falls second to airway. Question number 14. A potassium chloride infusion infiltrated into a patient's peripheral forearm IV. Which of the following is an appropriate intervention in this situation? Is it A, Administer phentolamine and apply cold compresses. B. Administer hyaluronidase and apply warm compresses. C. Administer hyaluronidase and apply cold compresses. Or D. Administer phentolamine and apply warm compresses. The answer is... B. Administer hyaluronidase and apply warm compresses. So when we are giving either phentolamine or hyaluronidase, what kind of compresses are we using? Are we using warm compresses or cold compresses? We are always going to use warm compresses after the administration of both of these medications. We talked about this slide earlier, but remember P for P. So phentolamine for vasopressors or phenytoin and hyaluronidase for other vesicants. Question number 15. 
which of the following unit strategies is likely to result in the lowest rate of CLAPSI? A. The nurse manager evaluates central line necessity for each patient. B. Unit house staff insert femoral central venous lines. C. If a CLAPSI is suspected, leave the line in until a root cause analysis is complete. Or D. Replace central lines every 72 hours. The answer here is A. The nurse manager evaluates central line necessity for each patient. So briefly looking at CLAPSIs or central line associated bloodstream infections, a CLAPSI is a confirmed bloodstream infection within 48 hours of central line placement. And just like CAUDIs, CLAPSIs also have nursing care bundles, which are evidence-based practice, and it has been shown to improve outcomes. So again, on insertion, we want to make sure that we are using aseptic technique. We want to avoid the femoral or the IJ sites. The subclavian is the most preferred. And use a CHG patch to decrease infection. When it comes to maintenance, we're going to review our line necessity daily. We will perform hand hygiene whenever coming into contact with central lines. We will disinfect before accessing the catheter. These patients will have a head-to-toe CHG bath daily. We will discontinue a line if there are signs of infection as soon as possible, and we don't want to routinely replace central lines unless necessary. Again, same as with the caudies, we want to assess the competency of staff who insert and care for lines. We want to perform root cause analysis on line infections, but do not leave the line in until that's complete. You want to educate all staff regarding CLAPSI prevention and share the results with staff as well. Last but not least, it would not be a multi-system lecture without throwing in a little hemodynamics. So our bonus question is, which one of the following sets of hemodynamic data is associated with warm or early septic shock? Is it A, a PAOP greater than 8, SVR less than 800, and an SVO2 greater than 75? B, a PAOP greater than 8, SVR greater than 1200, SVO2 less than 75%, C, a PAOP less than 8, an SVR greater than 1200, and an SVO2 less than 75%, or D, a PAOP less than 8, an SVR less than 800, and an SVO2 greater than 75%. And the answer here is D, a PAOP less than 8, an SVR less than 800, and an SVO2 greater than 75%. So if you remember from our hemodynamics and shock lecture, the hemodynamics of early or warm septic shock include an elevated cardiac output and index because early on the sympathetic responses kick in. And in septic shock, there is a massive inflammatory response in which endotoxins cause increased capillary permeability and there is significant capillary leak and third spacing of fluid. That is going to decrease your preload and PAOP is an indication of preload. So that will be less than 8. Additionally, this inflammatory response is going to cause massive vasodilation, which is going to decrease that resistance of blood pumping out. And that's indicated by the SVR, which will be less than 800. The SVO2 is going to be greater than 75%. It'll be increased because of impaired cellular oxygen saturation. 
Here, the oxygen delivery is adequate, but the cells can't extract that oxygen from the blood, so the tissues aren't being perfused well with oxygenated blood. You must know the hemodynamics of septic shock, as well as all of your other shocks. So for a more in-depth discussion, please go to my hemodynamics and shock lecture for a more in-depth review. All right, you guys, we have made it to the end. If you liked this video or you found it helpful, please like and subscribe to my channel. I would greatly appreciate it. As always, let me know if you have any questions. I would be more than happy to help. Anyone that's taking the CCRN soon, good luck to you. You have totally got this. Thanks, everybody, for watching. Nurse Jenny signing off here for Nurse Life Academy. Have a good one.